friends, Jerry Rosa here in the Rosa Stringworks Workshop. One of the questions that come up quite often is about stringing instruments. Everybody has their own method. I've kind of settled on a couple of uh, methods, and I'll be perfectly honest with you, these really weren't my original ideas, or at least most of it wasn't. What I'm about to show you would apply for anything with vertical posts. Uh, this would not necessarily be a stringing video for a violin or for uh, a classical guitar or something like that, but this will be for steel stringed instruments with vertical posts which would include banjos, mandolins, guitars. In fact, I'm going to use a mandolin as my example. But I don't think it would really make much difference whether you're doing a guitar, 12-string guitar, whatever. I, you pretty much do it the same way. So I hope you'll get something out of this. I'm going to turn the camera down here and we'll get started. Okay, well the very first thing is when you're going to string an instrument or restring an instrument is how to go about it. You know, when you have a movable bridge like this, if you're not good at setting intonation, you probably want to do one string at a time. And that's what I would recommend if you're not real good at setting the intonation. And who knows whether your intonation is correct or not. I do have tips and tricks on that in other videos. I'm not going to go into the intonation too much right now. We may talk about that a little bit as we put the strings on the instrument here. I'm just mentioning that because it would depend on how you want to go about unstringing your instrument. For me, I'm used to just ripping the strings off and going for it. So that's what I'm going to do is I'm going to loosen up all the strings and then the way I'm going to do it, because I can set the intonation without any trouble, is I'm just going to cut these strings off and put new strings on. By cutting them off, it saves a lot of time. So I'll just loosen them a little bit first to take the tension off the instrument. The high strings sometimes take a little bit more. Okay, so they're pretty much all rubber bands at this point. Then I just take a side cutter like this, and I just go through here where the where you have some room to work, and just cut them off. Now, again, because this is a floating bridge, it's going to move on me, so I can just set that aside. I'll show you how to do the intonation on that in a little bit. And a, the intonation would apply whether it's a, a guitar, mandolin, or banjo, if you have a movable bridge like that. Some people won't like this technique, but I just unwind it like that, pop it right off. You know, it doesn't scratch anything, it doesn't cause any problems. Some people think it's too crude of a way to do it, but that's okay. You can have your opinion and be that way if you want. You know, when you have to do a lot of instruments and you do them all the time, you have to find the most efficient way. And so that's the way I do it. You know, you can even take and grab them several at once like this and just unstring it. Now these over here are locked in a little bit, so they're a little harder to get out. Once I get them unwound, I can just pull it around like this and pull them out of there. Then in terms of your strings, I always coil them up before I dispose of them. Otherwise, they'll find their way back out of uh, whatever vessel you put them in. This is a good time to clean up your, your headstock because they get a lot of dust collected and things. You can oil it, you can wax it, you can do all that if you want to. That's going to be outside the scope of this video, but I do want to just wipe it off because it is pretty dusty. And I can also wipe off the fretboard. And this is a real good time to oil the, the fretboard. Um, so I tip, so I will do that. I'm using uh, Be Good Oil here. This has uh, got wax in it, be, uh, beeswax. Just a few drops is all it takes to pretty much do the whole fingerboard. This is also a good time to uh, level and recrown the frets and do a fret job and all that kind of stuff if that's what you need to do. Mine are pretty worn, there's no question about it, but I don't think I have to do a fret job at this time, so I'm not going to worry about that for the scope of this video either. I am actually going to use a slightly heavier string on my mandolins can handle that. I, I'm not worried about it. These are uh, these are considered, um, well, I don't know, they're 
medium heavy is what there's what it says on the package for the mandolin players out there these go from um, 41s down to 11 and a halfs so these are ej 75s is the brand i'm uh, it's a diadario brand i usually start on the uh, large strings myself now other people may start on the small strings and that really doesn't make too much difference it's whatever your preference is it's just my habit to start on the heavy strings first doesn't really make any difference and of course you hook it into your tailpiece and for mandolins um, this particular tailpiece <clears throat> just has straight connections some of them have a, an l shape where you start here and you wind it bend it around i used to do that a lot on those kinds of tailpieces but i don't anymore i just hook them on straight so i think that's all you really need to do in this case, because I have a, a bridge here that needs to be in place, I'm gonna go ahead and set the bridge in place like I did there. On the heavy strings, on the base side of the peg head, in other words, here's my method. Now this is very important, so I'm gonna zoom the camera in and let you see up close. What I do is I take the string and I actually pull it tight with my hand. So it's pull, and you go on the inside of the peg like this, through, through the inside of the peg head, and you wrap it around the peg, and you go around it one time, one, one full time, and then, um, you know, so you gotta, you make sure you have at least one full wrap, a wrap and a half to two wraps is real good, and then you go right back through the hole. And the point of this is that you're, you're, you started with the string here that's, that goes down the neck. So this part of the string goes down the neck here. And you can see that it's at the base of the post. You want your string to, as you tighten it, to be wound so that the string stays at the base of the post. You never want your string coming up to the top of the post. And the reason is that it acts like a lever and it puts a lot more pressure on your post pulling from the top than it does from the base. So you always want your string wound down that way. The point of doing it the way I just showed you is that the string is instantly tight. So it just takes the least little bit of turning and you're already almost up to pitch. Then, you, so on these bass strings, all you have to do is just bend the string straight up and cut it off flush with the top of the post. As long as you wound it at least a wound and a half, that's all you really need to do. So I'll show you that again. I'm putting on the second string here. I, I'm going around from the inside, around the post like so. And then I wrap back over the string. I, you can go a couple times if you want to. One and a half, I find, is, is sufficient because by the time you tighten it up, you'll be a full two wraps or more anyway. And so then you just pull it up tight like that and, and bring it up straight up and down and you can just cut it off. And then you just tighten it up. And on your bass strings, that's all you really need to do. I would put on these other two strings the same way on the bass side. Or if you had a six string guitar, these three on this side, you would do exactly like that. Now I'm gonna move over to the treble side and show you what I do on the treble side. It's a little bit different. You can do the treble side the same exact way, but if you do, you should wrap it around at least two to three times. I would say three times to be really safe. So what I do instead of that is I just do it more, more traditionally and I stick it through the hole from the, from the inside out, from the inside of the peg head out, stick it through the hole like so. I've got a little bit of a loop here as you can see and I just come back with the end of the string back under the string right here, pull it right back through and up. I hope you can see that. So that's, that's what I did. So, you know, I went through, around, back under, and then just straight up. That locks this string in where it cannot come loose. It would be impossible for that string to come loose now because it is actually wrapped tight around that post. It could not come loose, it cannot slip. And then I just tighten it up 
Now this one, this method, because you have slack in it, you will have to tighten a little bit more. You could potentially use a string winder if you prefer. The way I do it keeps a fairly short amount of wrap, so you don't have to spend a ton of time twisting this. You can see here I've done quite a few twists, but, but it only took a few seconds there to tighten it up. Then you cut it off again. So I'll show you that once more. Hopefully I'll get it in the camera a little better this time even, and maybe you can see it a little better. Okay, you go from the inside out. So from the inside of the peg head to the outside of the peg head, you leave about that much slack, just, just enough to kind of reach over to the other side there, just not very much slack. If you want to, another method you can do for counting your slack is like put two fingers under here, under right here, and, and pull it up tight. And that would give you enough slack also, if you, if you need a better method for how much slack. But I can just kind of eyeball it. I just pull it up and have that much slack in it right here, just a little bit of a curve. Come back around the post, under the slack, bring the wire, wire up through the middle. Now pull it up tight and then lift it up. This piece now is wrapped around the end here. I hope you can see that very simple method. Again, this takes a little bit more turning than the other side does. If you don't want to do this turning, like I said, you can wrap it two or three times around on the treble side and do it exactly like we did the bass side. It is easier, but you can potentially get a slippage that way unless you wrap it enough times. I think I'm going to uh, do the rest off camera. And then I'll just show you very quickly how you can set the intonation. Okay, my friends, we've got the strings on here now, and I don't have them up to tension, I don't, so we're not at pitch. I'm going to start tuning it up to pitch. What I would also recommend is, rather than bringing up one side to pitch all the way to pitch, bring up each string a little bit, stay below your pitch, and, and bring them up gradually. And the reason I say that is because, a number of reasons, it reduces a lot of stress on your instrument on one side or the other. And it also uh, lets the string stretch a little bit more naturally. Sure, you can stretch your strings out pushing on them and all that, but you know, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And when you're pushing on them like that, you're stretching it to that weakest link, if you will. I don't like to do that. I like to just let them stretch naturally. My strings rarely ever break when I do it that way. If you're a professional and you need to be on stage, then certainly stretch them because you're going to want, you don't want that stretch when you're on a live performance. But if you're at home just picking for yourself, I recommend you let them stretch naturally. Really, if you're going to set intonation on a movable bridge, before you bring it up to pitch, maybe you get the two outside strings close. You can even be a note low if you want, and you can still tell where your intonation should be. We'll just bring this top G string up to a G. There's pretty close. And then I noted at the 12th fret. Okay, it's noting perfect, but when I note it here, it's just the tiniest bit sharp. That means that this distance is short, so you would want to pull it back just a little bit. And you know, you, if you don't have too much tension on here, you should be able to move it. The trick about moving it with the tension on here is not letting it fall forwards or backwards. So you need to have a good firm grip on this and move it very, very minimal amounts. I kind of knew where this one goes anyway because there's marks on here from just long-term wear. I'm going to go ahead and tune this one up. That's only a D, it should be an E. But even with that, I can still note it here and see. It's a little bit sharp. A little bit sharp, not much. Just pull it back just a little bit. And then you can just go ahead and get it on up to um, 
pitch. Now, in terms of setting this intonation, what it, what it boils down to is you, you note it open and you note it at the 12th fret. If when you note it at the 12th fret, if it's sharp, that just means this distance is too short. So I just, I think of sharp as short. So you just need to pull this back a little bit. If when you note it at the 12th fret, this is flat, then I think of it as this is too far back. So you need to push it forward a little bit. That's just how I remember it. It's just the simple way I think of it. As I said, it's much better to set your intonation before you get the middle strings tuned up to pitch because otherwise it's too hard to move the bridge. On most instruments, as you go all the way across, the first strings you tune are going to drop in pitch. So you need to go through the instrument at least twice, at least twice, and generally three or four times. So now I'll go back through it one more time. Really getting close now. The other thing about tuning, by the way, is you never, and I absolutely say absolutely never, tune down to a note. You always tune up to your note. If you go past your note by accident, then you tune down below it and then tune back up to it. Never tune down to a note. If you do tune down to a note, you will think your tuning keys are slipping because there is what they call in play in your, in your gears, or it's actually called backlash. So your gear will hold for a little while if you tune down, but it's eventually going to slip. It's going to pull that backlash out of your gear and your string is going to go flat and you're going to think your tuning keys are slipping. And it really, these tuning keys for the most part, and I'm really talking 99.9 times out of 100, do not slip. They just don't slip. People think they do, they just don't slip. You can oil them all you want, they still don't slip. But you definitely need to tune up to the note. As I mentioned, the strings are gonna stretch. And for the first hour or so that you play it, they're gonna stretch quite a bit. But I still prefer letting them stretch naturally. You can stretch them out and push them on them like this and stretch them out if you prefer, if you, if you don't have that kind of patience, or if you're in, it, like I said, a live setting where you need for the string to, to settle down really quickly, stretching them by hand is a good way to do that. I typically am not in that much of a hurry. Although when I play on stage, you can bet I'll stretch them out. There I went, there I went above it, so now I, I tuned back below the note and I'm bringing it back up. Now it's a good idea to check your intonation one more time. So now I'm going to hit it open, make sure it's as close to perfect on the tuner as you can get. I'll let you see the tuner here. And then you note the note. It's just a hair sharp still. So what you, that means it's too short between here and here. So I'm just gonna pull it back just a little bit. Then you have to retune it open. It's hitting about the same place. When I tuned it open, I was uh, just a fuzz sharp on my open tuning. You do want to check it several times. That's pretty darn close, so I'm happy with that. That's going to work for me. So my friends, I hope you got something out of those tuning tips. If you have any further questions about that, put them in the comments. Thank you.